Welcome everyone for tonight's webinar on managing dryland pastures. So thank you for jumping on board. We're still going to have a few people um, come on to the webinar over the next few few minutes. So uh, we'll just sort of start with some introductions and then get unto underway. So I'm Laura Lake, the Extension Manager from Alexandra down um, in the Central South Island patch for Beef and New Zealand. We also have on the call Maria Shanks from Beef and New Zealand in Hamilton. Also got Natalie Stocker from Seed Force, she's based in around Timaru, and Hugh Murray from Farmlands based in around Cromwell. They will introduce themselves shortly, but and of course we've got Professor Derek Moat who's based in Christchurch tonight. So tonight we couldn't have held this webinar without our supporters. Um, they are on tonight, as I've mentioned, Hugh and Natalie are here. Um, and so they will mention a few words shortly. Um, they've kindly offered their support and we will um, and we thank them very, very much for that. Um, after hearing from our supporters, Derek will take the stage, starting with a short presentation, followed by your questions. So I will pass on to Natalie um, to introduce herself. Great, thanks Laura. Um, good evening everyone. It's great to see so many people turning out for the, the second um, dry land pastures webinar with Derek. Um, Seed Force is really proud to support this webinar series. Um, we've got a strong portfolio in the dry land pasture space and um, really support the fact that we're, we're having these conversations and looking at placing dry land pastures into environments that are sometimes challenged with some of the other species that are promoted in New Zealand. Um, Please, please, please uh, add some questions into the, the chat box at the bottom. There is no such thing as a stupid question. So um, we really encourage you to put things in there. Um, Derek will be answering those tonight. Um, and also after this point, if you've got any further questions, um, sing out to any of the people that are speaking. Um, search, search the Dryland Pastures uh, website at Lincoln University um, or, or get into contact with one of us and we can help you out. So thanks again, Laura and Derek. And um, yeah, hopefully everybody enjoys their evening. Thank you very much, Natalie, and we're um, pleased to have you on board. So, right out, we'll throw it on to Hugh now. Uh, welcome, Hugh. Uh, evening. Um, for the people not on last week's webinar, my name is Hugh Murray. I'm the Farmers Agronomist for Otago, based in Cromwell. Uh, again, on behalf of Farmers, I would like to say thank you to Laura and Beef and Land for organising the webinar on managing dry land species. Uh, I'd also like to again thank Professor Moot for giving up his time and I'm looking forward to hearing his tips and knowledge on managing dry land species as sometimes they, as Natalie said, they can be quite challenging. Uh, also a quick plug for Farmlands, last, uh, like last week, if any of our listeners would like to talk through dry land agronomy options for the upcoming season, please feel free to contact one of our nine regional based agronomists or numerous to DFOs throughout New Zealand who are more than willing to help. So um, thank you and enjoy the webinar. Thank you very much, Hugh, and pleased to have you on board as well. So now we'll move on to the main event, which is Professor Derek Moot. So last week, as you've heard, we held one of these uh, events and it was around um, establishing dryland pastures. Uh, we covered off mainly lucerne and subclover, um, taking your questions, um, around after the initial presentation that covered seeding windows, direct drilling, spraying, flowering through to um, other species such as Persian clovers and tree lucerne as well. So we, we did cover quite a lot within an hour and please uh, those people that were on this last week you know the drill just start typing questions and we will get around um, to as many questions as possible. So without further ado I shall pass on to Professor Derek Mate. so welcome Derek. Thanks, Laura, and uh, thanks for the opportunity of talking to people. Perhaps if there's any positives to come out of COVID, it's that um, our community has become much better at these sessions and, and getting information um, through them. So that's really good. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see my screen. Um, yep, but you just need to... Um, I need to shift you out of the way so I can, I can um, get it to... There we go. Hopefully that's working. All right, so what I want to today um, go through today is just understanding how um, plants grow because it's understanding how plants grow that allows us to think about the management packages that are most appropriate for a particular plant. 
And so the main focus of my research group has actually been to understand uh, the different requirements of different plants and then try and develop a, um, a management package around it. And so there are two key things that we look at. And for any plant species we're looking at, the first one is growth. And growth is what you would call kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. So at the moment, we're not getting very much growth. There's a lot of photosynthesis happening because there's a lot of sunshine out there, but the temperatures are too cold, so the leaves are not expanding very much, and we're not getting um, as much accumulation of dry matter as we would in the middle of summer. So that's growth, and that's driven by photosynthesis. And then the other process we need to know about for our plants is development. And we separate those two process, processes out, even though they're driven by similar things. But the process of development for a plant is when it flowers or when it produces leaves. So we talk about growth as the increase in dry matter and development as sort of the, the maturity or the age of the crop as it goes through its life cycle. And it's understanding what drives those factors that makes it, um, that, that makes management of those factors easier. And we've got two plants tonight that we're focusing on in the dry land. It's the lucerne and the, um, in the subclover, where understanding how they grow is really the key to understanding how to manage them. So that's, that's the focus of the research that we do. They're both driven by environmental signals. Now, one of the first things that we worked out with lucerne was that there was a very strong, this is an irrigated lucerne crop, and there was a very strong relationship between temperature and growth. So the plant was growing really quickly, and as we increased the mean temperature, then we got an increase in the growth rate of the plant. But when we looked at the autumn, we saw that under the same conditions, so let's say 12 degrees, we got a different growth rate. This one's about 30, whereas in the spring it might have been about 60. And that got us to thinking, why is it that this plant, it's got nitrogen, because it fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere, and it's got water, because this was an irrigated crop. Why has it got such a difference in growth rates in the spring and the autumn. And so we did an experiment and we looked at how the plant was growing. And what we found was that in the spring, the plant is using, it is taking a lot of the energy that it's stored below ground. So this is the taproot dry weight. This is the underground dry weight. And through the spring from August through to December, it's actually losing weight. And so what it's doing is it's taking some of its stored underground reserves, just like a deciduous tree at the moment has no leaves, it's stored all its nitrogen and sugar, carbon in the trunk, and then in the spring, it's going to spring into, into um, life. And our lucerne plant is doing the same. And that's why it had that higher growth rate in the spring, because it's growing based on how much photosynthesis it's got, but also it's got added growth from what's coming from below ground to help it grow. But in the autumn, it has to fill that bucket of sugar back up, it has to fill its root system back up. So you can see here that um, actually, we've gone from three tons of biomass down to one and a half tons by the longest day. And then in the autumn, we've got this happening here where the, the underground biomass or the root biomass is increasing again. So this phase here is really the period where we wanna maximize production and this uh, of animals, and this phase here is when we want to look after the plant. And we found it didn't matter what we did to the plants, if we cut them too quickly, um, we actually saw exactly the same pattern, but it's the autumn that we needed to give it a rest. This crop here that we cut after 28 days, actually we killed it in two years. So the autumn was a key period for understanding and giving it a rest. So that understanding of how that plant grows and its, its response to the environmental signals, which is the day length, allowed us to say, you know what? You don't have to wait for lucerne to flower. Let's start using it as soon as it starts growing in the spring. So whatever environment you're in, if the lucerne's starting to grow, use it. And that's what we've been advocating for um, the last 20 years or so. So that first spring rotation is aided by root reserves and it produces high quality vegetative dry matter. So we can get in and use it, you know, and there's about 1500 kgs of dry matter or even a bit less if you need to start and ideally put ewes and lambs on it. The growing point of a lucerne plant is at the top. So the growing point is the bit that produces the leaves. 
in, in a grass plant, that growing point is below ground. And if it's below ground, then we can set stock and we can just remove the leaf and we'll produce another leaf. But with lucerne, the growing point's at the top. So if it's bitten off, then it has to produce a new stem. And that's why we rotationally graze um, lucerne as much as we can. So here is an example of rotational grazing from one of our experiments. And you can see um, over time, so this looks like we started in September 2011 at about the third week of September. And we had about 1200 kgs of dry matter. So the first paddock in our rotation, we started with about 1200 kgs of dry matter. That's probably only about 10 centimetres tall, 12 centimetres tall. And then very quickly, the second paddock had gotten up to two tonnes, and the sixth paddock in the rotation was already up at around four tonnes. Because lucerne really takes off in the spring, so we have to get onto it reasonably quickly in the spring. So this is each paddock, paddock one, two, three, four, five, and six of our um, six paddock rotation. And that was being grazed with ewes and lambs. And what we left behind is here. So for the first paddock, there was virtually no residual because it's all very high quality feed. In the second paddock, this one here, again, not much residual. Three, four, those two there, we've left behind about 800 kilos of dry matter because we're starting to get a bit of a stem produced. And by paddock six, when we've got four tons of biomass, actually we left behind about 1200 kgs of dry matter. Because in any lucerne stand that you've got, there's about two and a half to 2.8 tons of good quality leaf. And the rest of it is stem. So you want that stem if you're cutting a hay crop, because you need to be able to get the cutter bar to go through it. But if you're grazing, you really don't want to be having much of that stem. So ideally, we're trying to get the lucerne at around three tons. And you can see in this example, that when we came back to paddock one, it had regrown to about 2.8 tons. And then paddocks two, three, and four were all good around that three ton mark. And five and six had got away on us a wee bit again. And so you can see we've got a bit more residual there being left. But we're grazing at about the right time, around that three ton of biomass. But if we hadn't started this one early in the spring, we would have started here and this one would have gotten too much. And then these would have all gotten too much and we would have wasted the feed. So we had two good rotations here um, through six paddocks from about the third week of September through to December with ewes and lambs. And then we weaned and then the weaned lambs came on and they had another um, six paddocks of rotation of grazing here. And they leave a little bit more behind. The weaned lambs, you can't expect them to work as hard. So at the same level, they'll leave a little bit more behind. Um, and we don't want them to be eating hard because we're eating too, too much down because we want them to grow. And then it got dry. So you can see the paddocks are not recovering that much, uh, that well. And we've been dry here for us. That was about February. So that is a true dry land grazing management that we've had um, through that experience there. So early start, and then we've run out of water here, and we've destocked. But our lucerne has given us one, two, three, four rotational grazes through each of the paddocks. And here you can see the residual that we left behind each time. And we've come back in, we've had a bit of regrowth in, um, in May, and we've used that for some hogget grazing. So that's what a lucerne grazing system can look like. This is a photo from um, Doug's. It's, I think it's my photo, but I took it at Doug's. And they've just taken down, Doug Avery just taken down the, the fence here. But I like this photo because it shows the residual. They haven't eaten every last little bit of the, the lucerne. They've gone, no, actually, let's just shift them on. And you can see here, absolutely no flowers, but about 30 centimetres of height, maybe 25, 30 centimetres of height and the animals um, getting in and eating it. So really important that you understand that rotational grazing. If this had gotten taller, there'd still be about two and a half tons of good stuff, but um, we just have more stem. And why we're interested in grazing at about three tons or about 30 centimetres in the spring period is because then we have very high quality leaf. Near me is 12 and it's about, you know, all of that is going to be pretty much leaf with just a little bit of stem. If we grow more, if we grew four and a half tons, the leaf is still high quality, but we've got more stem and the stem here has only got an ME of eight. That's maintenance, this is growing animals, if you remember the slide that I showed you last week. 
and a little bit of fiber being caught up here, and I'm not gonna go into um, great detail about this, but we can maybe get to that in questions. Here, this is the same paddock, and, and um, they put a little bit of fiber out here, um, and some salt being available to them, particularly in the spring when they're eating. In the autumn, recognizing that that plant needs some time to put sugar back under the ground, in the autumn, we need to give it a bit of a rest. So at one period in the autumn, now autumn is sometime between February and April, we need to let the plant build up its root reserves and um, be able to kick off and give us good spring growth again the following year. So my emphasis is on spring grazing management for animals, and then one period in the autumn giving the um, plant a, a chance to build up its root reserves. In autumn, like we've just had, where it's dry the whole time, it's difficult to do that. So we just need to understand that the plant hasn't built up its root reserves this year. If we've got a chance, we need to try and give it that opportunity to do it next year. And so letting a plant flower once in the autumn is, is really what we're looking for. If you get too late, if you get into March or April, it may not flower, but it's still doing that, putting the stuff under the ground, recharging um, the biomass under the ground. So those are the key points for Lucerne, and we'll pick up on any of those in questions. Um, and then I just wanted to do a little bit on subclover. I showed this slide last week saying, you know, if there's the odd subclover plant around, every second step, if you step on a subclover plant when you work up a hill, walk up a hill, that's enough to um, get the subclover going. And we're looking for its flowering. So um, the key things in grazing management for subclover is to recognize its flower and be able to give it a chance to set seed. It's an annual plant. It's a winter annual, works like barley grass, germinates in the autumn, grows through the winter, and then early spring, and then it dies. And it has to set seed in that late spring period to give it a chance. But the first time you've got a subclover stand out or you're managing a subclover pasture, you must let it set seed. So understanding that flowering, understanding the development of the plant, when it's going to flower, is pretty important. They, they come available from about mid-September on, and it needs about four to five weeks of um, not sheep on the paddock. If the sheep on the paddock, they'll graze those subclover plants and take them away. Basically what you're looking for is to produce a runner. And I showed this slide last week. Here's the flower, self-fertilizing. Here's the burr it's putting under the ground. And what you can do is you can just go along and grab this at this end and pull it up. And if you pull it up and all the seeds pull out of the ground, then it's not ready to be grazed because you, what you want is that these stems here will break off and leave that burr of seeds in the ground. And if they stay in the ground, then you've got them set. So you can pick when I should be able to graze a, um, a subclover plant after in that phase of, of letting it set seed by pulling on the end of this burr. And that's actually what the sheep do. Sheep come along and take it off there. So cattle at this time are better than sheep. Some cattle to stay on top of the grass are pretty important through that spring period if you're trying to build up your seed bank and get lots of seed in the ground. The biggest challenge, the elephant in the room, is actually controlling the grass. And so once you've set that seed, so you've set it one year, you want that seed to come back the next year. And it's important that in the middle of um, summer, you get an opportunity to graze down quite hard on the subclover. And you can see that um, in this property, there's been some electric fences put up, to, to force the animals to eat this tag off, and that's what they've done here. This is from Dave Reed's property at YR Station in Wairoa, and he's using um, some brake fencing to really get on top of the tag and allow that opportunity for the subclover to come through and grow um, later on in the, in the autumn. This is a photo from Tempello in Marlborough, one of David Griggs' um, photos, and the same thing. Now, David didn't really sow a lot of seed. What he did was learn what subclover was, and how to manage it. And he's grazed this paddock off in a similar sort of fashion to allow the subclover to come through. And you can see the cattle in here have been doing that job for him. He probably had these cattle in there, to be honest, at some point, um, eating that out and getting a really nice um, removal of that tag, which is an impediment or stops the, the subclover germinating. So some grazing tips around subclover. When, if you're trying to build up your subclover, cattle are better for that than sheep. Once you've got subclover and it's growing really well in the spring, then it's okay. You can set stock, you can take advantage of it. But the first challenge 
is to get your subclover content up in your pastures. And cattle are your groomers. Cattle will do that for you. So in the autumn, we're wanting them to remove the grass competition. In the late winter, early spring, then we can use ewes and lambs on there, and we should be using ewes and lambs on there for lactation. As we get to late spring, we should be um, putting the cattle in and allowing the seed set. And in early summer, we bring the cattle back and, and eat quite a bit of that. Um, and, and then the summer, we'll do, the cattle will remove that tag. So the sheep can also remove the tag. Um, and at that time, we're talking about dry stock. So uh, generally, it's your dry ewes that you can put on to, to do that job. So subclover is all about managing the seed bank the first year and then taking advantage of the fact you've set that seed and having some really early um, lactation feed the following year. So the grazing management of subclover requires a little bit of understanding of how the plant grows, and so does the grazing management of lucerne. Part of our Hill Country Futures program with Beef and Lamb New Zealand um, actually involves defining some of these growth curves and finding out how the plants um, are growing. So those are sort of the, some simple tips for um, lucerne and subclover. But I think the best thing to do is actually to take people's questions, because uh, I could talk for an hour on each of these, but I think I'd rather answer people's questions than, than go into great detail on them. Perfect. Thank you very much for that, Derek. It's great to be able to look at some pictures um, just for that visual aspect when you are talking about some of those items. So just going into the Q&A section at the moment, everyone. So please chat in your questions. Um, obviously, you'll probably get some questions as they go, as we go throughout the day as well. But we do have some questions that got sent in uh, when people registered. So we've got some questions to start with. Um, and they're all loose in ones at the moment, Derek, so you thought, hey, you'll, you'll be all over it. But I thought I might start with a bit of a left field one, just to, just to test you. Um, so it is grazing tips for lucerne when used in a dairy platform and, and how they can utilise lucerne within the dairy system. Yep, that is a bit left field for a dry land pasture farmer, but that's okay. Um, I've worked with a couple of farmers that are using lucerne on their dairy platform and they're using it in different ways. So perhaps the easiest way is to have a paddock of lucerne and um, the way that we uh, have been doing it around the Taupo region is um, the dairy cows go to their morning milking and then they go to um, their afternoon paddock and then about two hours before they're due to have their afternoon milking they're given a break of lucerne. And the cows actually run, it's like lollies to them. They run to that lucerne paddock and you've just got to keep an eye on them. They gorge themselves for about 45 minutes and then they sit down, um, ruminate and then go off to um, afternoon milking. But I think that as an introductory way of doing it in a dairy system, that ticks a lot of boxes because um, you're essentially ensuring the animals are not hungry. So because they've had milking and then you've taken them to the paddock to eat after milking so they're not empty coming out of the shed and they've got a full belly before they go into the, the afternoon ice cream that they get and in those situations um, the the farmers tell me they immediately see an increase in the milk production in the vat because the, the animals are effectively eating pure legume and if they're doing that their intake can be higher so they can actually eat more and therefore produce more milk so that break feeding for a couple of hours before going into milking in the afternoon is um, a reasonable way of doing it. Other people obviously are making silage and feeding silage out um, when the animals are being milked. So those are two fairly simple ways of initially starting lucerne in a, in a dairy platform. Yep. That's great, thank you for that. And it's quite cool to get some dairy questions come through on a dry land um, beef and lamb webinar. Uh, there's a few that are um, more around weeds and management of weeds, so I might go on to these next. So, whorehound. How can you manage whorehound, especially in a young crop? Yeah, look, there aren't easy answers to whorehound management, and so it depends on where you are. Um, you've really got to try and make sure you've got control of whorehound before you go into a paddock. And, um, in fact, I've just put a a bit on our dryland pastures website that's come from Snow Loxton recently on, um, or it's about to go up on our website, on whorehound control. So he's 
suggesting pasture is really useful. So um, he's, he's even indicates, you know, the dreaded ryegrass is quite good for suppressing um, whorehound and you've got to get control of it before you go into the lucerne. If you've got it in the stand, in your lucerne, you, you've got to use a grubber. You just basically have to. Um, but there is some light on the horizon and that snow has been really good at bringing in a biological control agent. So there's a clear wing moth um, that's actually doing quite a good job, just starting to establish itself as a biological control agent for whorehound. And it's a wee way off before it will multiply up and be distributed everywhere, but it is coming. Um, and obviously there's some chemicals you can use as well, and some of those are on our um, website as well. But I, I always remember Doug Avery telling me when I drove around his place that all of the utes had a, a grubber in the back. And whenever they went past, if anyone saw a warhound, they basically just grubbed uh -huh. it. And I know that sounds really difficult, but um, it's important that you deal with those areas, like the knocky, rocky sheep camps and stock camps where it can get away on you, that's, it's pretty important to deal with those um, as, as much as possible. It, it's becoming more of a problem and it's unfortunately um, one of our main issues, which is why we've looked at trying to get a biological control agent in. So it's not a satisfactory answer and if anyone's got a better answer, um, I'd happily see it come through on the chat. Yeah, and I will get a few links, um, hyperlinks to websites that you've just mentioned there and send that out in the follow-up email after this webinar later on in this week um, for, for everyone's knowledge there too. So the next weed is dandelions. How can you eradicate dandelions from lucerne? Not easily. Um, so can we have the easy questions, please? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are some products so that and I'm sure the farmlands reps and people would be telling you their own recipes some people have got their own recipes effectively what happens with dandelion is as your stand opens up then you're providing a lovely environment for a tap-rooted species to become um, to become involved in the in the plant and I know there are people that have um, grazed their stand off very hard in the autumn and then used some chemicals that are not registered on lucerne. So I can't really talk about those in an open forum. Um, but there are a couple of examples, classic uh, and spinnaker at, at an establishing stand. But once you've got a um, established stand and the, the, it's not just dandelions, it's the cats here, the whole family of them. Once you get those established into a lucerne stand, you've really got to think about, um, am I actually going to keep this stand? Is the population high enough? or am I prepared to lose it? And then you might use some um, more rigorous chemicals that may not have a registration for dandelion on them, but you've just got to accept that if you lose the stand, you lose the stand. And if someone wants to contact me about that, I'm happy to talk about it, but probably not here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, we can just leave that for those people to contact you directly. Yep. Um, so still on this theme, so we're having a few issues in Lucerne with open sword being a great home for weed development. What would you advise to possibly avoid this, e.g. Um, plant another species? So it, you, you should have a Lucerne stand that's working pretty well when you first establish it. And it shouldn't really be a weed issue until you're getting to years five and six. If you're getting it before then, it suggests that your winter weed control isn't as successful as it should be, or that there's some other reason why the stand is opening up, possibly due to the grazing management or something else. But really it's as that stand gets a bit older that you get weed ingress. Um, and so then you've got to think, well, what do I, am I going to take the stand out or do I want to keep the stand for a bit longer? Now at that stage, I'd be thinking maybe you put in a brome grass for a couple of years. And so you have a lucerne brome, you just direct drill in brome and that would give you a lucerne brome for a couple of years, and that can be quite good lambing feed. Um, but the monoculture, it's really about keeping the, the, um, the weeds out as much as possible, and some of that is grazing management and some of it is chemical control. Winter weed control is really important. So you, you've got to look at a lucerne stand evolve over time as it gets older and it opens up, and, and it will. Any, any stand like a forest, it will open up and there will become opportunity for weed to become established. Um, so then, yeah, direct drilling in 
a, a, something like a brome that would do it two or three years, or you might put an Italian ryegrass in. You might graze it off and drill Italian ryegrass, and that will give you some control in the autumn. Um, if you get some moisture, then the Italian ryegrass can come through, and you're really then looking at the end of your end of life of the stand. Um, if you if your weeds become too too much, then it's it's time to say that's it. It's not productive anymore. The biggest issue as we move into areas that are wetter, perhaps not where you are, Laura, but in some of the other areas where people have put lucerne into areas that are higher rainfall, the biggest thing to do is make sure you control your um, weed grasses because that frequent rainfall or more frequent rainfall germinates seeds on the surface and so you've got to do more weed control if you're in a wetter environment. If you're in a dry environment then the loose end wins because it's got the deep tap root and so it's keeping that that dry um, soil surface as dry as possible is important to to reduce weed content as well but weeds are an inevitable part of a loose end stand. Um, I'm just going to build on that. We've had a couple of questions about this as well. So you'd ra um, recommend drilling in a brome rather than a clover, because some people have asked, could they put a clover in with the lucerne? Um, certainly not an establishment. I wouldn't want... If you're putting lucerne with grass at establishment, the grass will dominate within about two years. So you'll have a grass paddock. But as a stand gets older, then you can look at it and say, well, this paddock's still quite good. It's not perfect, but it's still quite good. So I could put some brome in at that point. Um, if you're putting clover in, the, it's then a question of which clover am I trying to put in to help. So I could try putting white clover in. Taproot's going to die in six months. It's going to spread itself across the top of the lucerne stand. It will suppress the shoots. If I put red clover in, their grazing management's actually slightly different. I don't think it will establish. Um, if I put an annual clover in, like sub clover, um, again, I'm going to compete with the lucerne. So that's where I'm recommending a grass goes in um, as an older stand starts to, you know, it's not quite bad enough that I want to take it out, but um, it's a grass is probably better. At Coxfoot's another one that people use um, to, to drill into a lucerne stand. So I, the, the, the advantage of the brome is you tend to get um, you tend to get earlier winter activity out of a brome. So the brome grass grows better in the winter, so it sort of offsets the season, whereas Coxfoot's main growing season is actually the same as Lucerne. They're both trying to grow in the summer. So the, the winter activity of the brome is why I'm suggesting the brome ahead of um, other grasses or other legumes. Yep. Okay. I see so the question there. I've just seen there's one about red fescue because it's another weed. Um, actually, I can't answer that one. It's, you've got red fescue coming up in a three to five year old lucerne stand. That You may not have caught that question yet, Laura. Um, but red fescue is actually a developing weed that we don't really know a lot about it at this stage, but it's becoming um, quite a, a weed in dryland areas, a bit like Volpia. The two of them are becoming quite major weeds. and um, we need to do a little bit more work on red fescue. Okay, cool, thank you. Um, I don't think there's any weed ones so far, so we'll move on. So how late can we wait to give lucerne its five week spell? Is April through to May too late? It depends on what part of the country that you're living in. So um, if you've already had lots of frosts in April, then it's too late. Um, but if you're in a warmer part of the country and you've got some growth happening, then that's absolutely perfect. April through to May is sort of uh, works quite nicely because often you, your stock numbers are at their minimum, your lambs have gone, you've actually got time to give the lucerne a rest at that stage, um, April, May. And then if you went through with a mob of ewes and grazed it through that April, May period, do your weed control in June, you're setting yourself up for um, growth again through August and September. So if you've got growth, the, the key thing is you can't give the lucerne stand a rest when it's the middle of winter and it's freezing. It actually needs a wet a rest when there are conditions of growth. So when you've got some moisture and the opportunity for it to grow. Now, if you are leaving it till April, May to give it a rest, it may not flower. In fact, it probably won't flower. So I keep telling people, you know, wait for the flowering in the autumn if you can you're generally only going to see those flowers in February, March. 
Once you get into April and May, the day length is actually getting so short that the plant doesn't want to flower. But that's okay. It's still spent that time pumping that sugar and nitrogen under the ground. So it's doing the process even if it didn't get to flowering. So April, May, if it fits your farm system, is absolutely fine if those are a period when you get growth. And what are the benefits, well, pros and cons of lucerne under irrigation versus lucerne in dry land? Uh, yep, good question. So the pro of lucerne and dry land is very straightforward. It's growing early in the spring, it's got a deep tap root, it's got nitrogen, so you're not having to put nitrogen on, so it's using the water that's available as efficiently as possible. All our grasses are nitrogen deficient, so we're not growing as much feed and we haven't got as much quality. So in the dry land, very straightforward. In the irrigated situation, that's how most of the world grows lucerne. So most of the world actually grows lucerne in irrigated areas. So North America, all the animals are fed on irrigated lucerne. So they cut and carry and they feed it in the feedlots with maize um, to all the dairy cows, all the beef cows. So it depends on what you're trying to achieve. You can maximize yield from a, an irrigated stand, but the difference is you've got to give it a big drink. Don't give it lots of little drinks. So the disadvantage of lucerne under irrigation is we tend to irrigate it like with a center pivot the way we do grass. And so we might give it five mils and we come back and we give it another five mils. And all you're doing is keeping that surface wet. And if you keep the surface wet, you're germinating a whole lot of weeds. So you end up with a weedy stand that requires a lot more chemical control. But if you don't do that and you give it a big drink, it needs two big drinks. It needs a drink when it's about uh, you know, just as the, if you've cut it or you've grazed it, just as the leaves start to open again for the new set of shoots, it needs a big drink, 40 mils. And then as it's growing, about a week before you're due to cut it or harvest it, it needs another 40 mils. So that's the disadvantage, is that you might not have your irrigation system set up to be able to give it two big drinks rather than lots of little drinks. Lucerne likes a big drink because you then wet the soil all the way down the profile and it will dry the, the surface out really quickly because that's where it will start using the water first and it will beat the weeds. But if you give it lots of little drinks, you're just giving the weeds the chance to germinate and then more water for them to grow. So that's the disadvantage of lucerne under irrigation. The advantage is I don't need nitrogen. So the limitation for grass under irrigation is I need nitrogen. So I don't need nitrogen because it's fixing its own nitrogen. And if I've got to do grass um, somewhere else, it, the lucerne doesn't need as much water. So if you've got it in a pivot, the segment that's under lucerne could be irrigated less frequently than the other plants that have got shallower roots. Hopefully that answered those ones. It does. So I was just trying to um, dissect other question. Um, we will move on to some more area specific questions. So the ideal soil temp for sowing spring lucerne and what's a good current low stem high leaf lucerne variety for Marlborough? Um, so the, the soil temp one about two weeks after you'd sow a spring sow a grass so you're looking for about 12 degrees and holding, okay? So you, you, you're wanting the temperature to have warmed up to about 12 degrees. And the colder area that you're in, the more you wanna make sure that that temperature has come up. So I'd be looking for um, 12, maybe even up to 14 degree um, temperature, but the difficulty, so you've gotta ensure that you have dealt with your winter crop so that you've, you're building up some moisture in the spring. Because if you go too early and it's cold, again, all you're going to do is give the weeds an advantage. So holding off a little bit is actually an advantage, provided you've kept the moisture. And so that's important that it's a fallow that you're coming out of or you've sprayed so that it's direct drilling into um, a part, an old pasture or a, a stubble of some crop that you've, you've retained the moisture and then let the soil temperature come up 12, 14 degrees to go from there. Um, in terms of cultivars, I don't tend to get into cultivars in a, in a great way. Um, I think there's a lot 
of cultivars out there now. There's more, and, and you've got to work out which one works for you. For me, um, I give this advice everywhere I go, I'd buy the cultivar from the person that gives you the best advice. You know, the best agronomic package afterwards is actually worth dealing with. Um, I've, I've not really looked at, we, we've done um, experiments for people, we've looked at different cultivars. Actually, we don't find a huge amount of difference in um, the amount that they grow. So we haven't seen enough to say, you know, this is good and this one's bad. I, I think it's more important to get good agronomic advice from the stand that you've put in. That's, that's my key. And that's a plug for all those people that are giving the agronomic advice to do it properly. Well, um, go ask farmlands. We've got them on board tonight, <laughs> so that'd be a good place to start. <laughs> um, so what do you suggest to grow up in Northland where it's summer, autumn dry, but, but winter wet, um, especially around the fresh and bull finishing aspect? You know, I don't know. I, I, I find Northland a difficult, I haven't spent a lot of time there and, and I'd be reluctant to um, really get into that in a great deal of detail. Although I think it's worth trying Lucerne. So I know, I think it's, there's a, um, a tech up there, Gavin Usher, I think is, is up in that, and I might have the name wrong, but I think that's right. But there are some Northland specific trials being done at the moment with different legumes. So I think I'd rather wait another year to get the results of those, but they've been quite impressed with the lucerne in that environment. But I'm, I'm not familiar enough with the soils in Northland and whether I'm on the, the west side or the east side to, to really get um, into great detail about. I think it's quite specific for the Northland area. Um, but the warmth that you're talking about is sort of, it's ideal lucerne growing temperatures in that winter period, you know. So I think it's worth trying. My, my suggestion always is you try lucerne. And when lucerne doesn't work, you're looking for other options because the be biggest bang for your buck, if you can do lucerne, that's the plant that will give you the most yield, the greatest livestock um, production, and the easiest, you know, we know the management package of it. All the other legumes that we use, we'll have to think about how we put grasses in or they'll be a one season or two season plant whereas the lucerne is going to be our longest lived perennial as well. So you, you, you start there and then if that doesn't work, you look at other options. Um, yeah. So I need to get to Northland. If somebody wants me to come at some point, I'd be quite keen on a, on a winter holiday. <laughs> I probably shouldn't have said that. <laughs> well, we've got some Northlanders here and I see that um, whoever put that question in, someone's um, put an answer in the chat box for you. Of that where Gavin Usher is based. Okay, so oh, that's great. Yeah, and and G Gavin's been in touch with me a couple of times, and we've been through that. Um, and I think the data he's collecting over the last couple of years will be quite useful. I'll just give a plug as well. The other thing we're doing is putting this national forage database together under the Hill Country Futures program, and part of that is to try and get all of the local results for different areas into one place. So that when Gavin Ash is not there in 25 years' time, we've still got that information held and people can find out about it. So that's useful. Thanks for that. Well, thank you, everyone, for your help in that space. Um, so just moving on to some other species. So where can they source sub-clover from? Um, well, you've got two reps on board, the farmlands and the um, seed force people. I, I think both have sub-clover. The key thing about sub-clover is you need to talk to your reps early because we import all of the seed. In Lucerne, we actually grow some seed here and we import it and it's become a big enough market that the seed companies are interested. We've got to be quite um, realistic here. Perennial ryegrass and white clover are, I don't know, 90, 93% of the total seed sales in New Zealand. Okay, They're, they dominate seed sales. So we've got to be realistic that if we're going to do something like subclover, we've got to talk to our um, merchant early so that we can let them know so they can try and source seed from Australia because it's all got to be brought in and they've got to have an idea for next autumn how much they need to be bringing in now because the sub clover seed is going to be produced in Australia you know this spring and so they you've got to talk to your, your merchant about 
you know, are you looking for 50 tons? Or are you looking for five tons? What, what do you want? How much do you, um, you know, want 20 kilos? They, they need to get a feel for um, how much the market might be. Because it's difficult for them to bring in um, quite a, a lumpy sort of a, a plant. Whereas ryegrass, they'll just, we'll produce ryegrass seed because we can do that. But we don't produce subclover seed in New Zealand. Once again, that is another plug for Farmers and Seed Forces to touch base with them. <laughs> well, I mean, there are, the other companies do as well, but, but I know those two do have access to subclover. Um, yep. Cool. I'm just going to have to read this one pretty carefully so I get it right. Um, so target grazing residuals and kg dry matter per hectare and target grazing rotation in days for either pure swords of Persian clover or swords with the high component of Persian clover? Okay, so I'm picking this as probably a North Island one because Persians generally prefers the warmth. Um, what I would suggest with grazing something like, so for Persian clover in that case, I'm thinking it's uh, probably not going to be setting seed. You're looking to just use it as a one-off crop. What you want to do is you um, pretty much look at the same thing. If you pick a stem, and if you've got a hard stem, you've left it too long. You want to go in and graze it when you've got cover of about 30 centimetres and then take it down to, similar to a lucerne stand, you, you probably want to leave behind um, five to eight centimetres of residual so that when you look down on the paddock, you can still see green leaf and that will allow it to recover quicker. That's the key for the these top flowering um, annual clovers is they need some residual left behind, a bit like red clover. You don't want to eat red clover till there's nothing left in the paddock because then it takes too long to get back and cover the ground again. So um, I'd be thinking of a rotation that, lee that, that goes in probably similar at about 30 centimetres and leaves sort of eight centimetres, five to eight centimetres behind. And I can't do cages of dry matter on that because we haven't done it, but that would be off the top of my head the, the best option. The person just don't treat it the way you do a grass because it's not going to recover as quickly as a grass does. Now we're going to move into some animal health ones. Um, Costa deals in sheep, eight and one or seven and one? Uh, not being a vet, I can't answer that. Um, my suggestion would be talk to a vet on that. The only advice I've ever had. I had one farmer who was having a lot of trouble with um, clostridial disease and he was using five and ones and he went to a 10 and one and he said what the 10 and one did was make sure he was much better at doing his vaccinations because it was more expensive. Um, but then I talked to a vet and the vet said, well, actually three of those strains are for cattle and they don't make any difference to sheep. So I really think you need to get a vet to answer that one as to what the strains are in the eight and one versus the seven and one. Is it a sheep strain of clostridial um, bacteria that we've got that's the difference? And is it a clostridial strain that we have in New Zealand? Because sometimes these vaccines are actually made um, in the same product as sent to Australia or South Africa, but actually we don't have that particular strain of bacteria um, in New Zealand. So yeah, I think that question is best answered by a vet. The key thing is that I'm really pleased to hear people are using it. That's, you know, it's important that it's being used and um, really important that we get that right. Because when you've got fast growing animals, they find lots of ways to die. So making sure you've got them vaccinated is a really good thing. And if we've got any vets on the call, maybe if you could just message Maria um, and she might be able to um, try to sort out an answer for that. Talk to you. So you can private message her. Um, right, so land growth this year on their lucerne um, haven't been as good as previous years. Could the cooler temps and less sun um, this season be the cause? I'm seeing that one is from Grant Catto because <laughs> I was trying to think, where's it been cool and wet? <laughs> Cause the, the, and I'm going, okay, that's northern Southland, Grant. I see that's come from you. Um, yes, that would be not a lot of sunshine. So. Um, in, in that case, the uh, sugar levels, the energy levels in the lucerne may have been down a little bit. The plant may not have grown as much and it might have had excess protein because it will still be fixing nitrogen. So 
you're probably right that the cooler temperatures certainly would have not favoured the lucerne um, in that situation. And, and it would have dropped the, the animal production. But being cool and wet, there's some other things that can happen. Um, you could also have an increased worm burden because cool, wet herbage is going to have a, you know, there's more potential for having a worm burden, although with lucerne there's less potential than a grass, um, but it's probably the cool temperatures and less sun. And in your situation, Grant, um, down there in, in northern Southland, I'd suggest most people are going that you had a lucky season because you had rain. Um, the rest of the country didn't really get any. So um, when you get a dry season, hopefully it'll boom away for you and be, um, be, be useful again in a drier season. Thank you for that. Um, so do you need to mow lucerne for management or can it be sole, a sole grazed stand? It can absolutely be a sole grazed stand. Um, so let's just go through the difference between mowing and grazing. So uh, I think last week I said when you're establishing a lucerne stand, if you're going to mow, that's the one I'd mow. I'd leave that one to flower. So if you're putting that in in October sometime, then around Christmas you might want to mow that stand. Um, and that could be made into hay. And, and that's because I want you to let that stand grow and flower and really get the plant established. And then you've actually got a thick base. And the base of the stem well, the cutter bar will go through it and it'll be, you know, 40 centimetres, 45 centimetres long and you can bale it up quite nicely. But ideally, we're wanting lucerne to be eaten at about 30 centimetres. My hands sort of go, you know, 30 centimetres. Now, the base of the stem at that point is still quite soft, so you wouldn't ever cut that because it wouldn't actually cut very well. So really all you're doing when you're cutting is growing another 10 centimetres of height so that you can get a thickened stem at the bottom so you can put the, the cutter bar of the mower through it. Um, so there's no reason to do that. You can graze a lucerne stand continuously. The other thing is if the stand gets away on you, sometimes there can be some residual stems. So you've grazed the lucerne stand, but there's 10, 15 centimeters of stalk sitting there. Um, if you want to mow that, you can, but it's cosmetic. It's not really affecting the regrowth of the lucerne stand. So you could run a mower across um, and make sure you stay high, sort of eight centimetres above the ground so that you're, taking, you're not taking the new shoots off. But it is just a cosmetic thing. It's not really doing any damage. But in doing that, in a couple of the experiments we did, mowing those stems actually put them on the ground and they provided a mulch, which then actually reduced our weed content. So it's just anecdotal. I mean, I didn't measure that, but, but that's what happened. We weren't the best grazing managers a couple of times and it got way too... Um, way too stemmy, so we did just mow it off and those stems eventually rot away, but they covered the ground and provided us with some really good weed control. Okay. But my preference is that you'd eat it. Okay, my okay. preference is always that you eat it. That's the best way, best way of getting the, the, the maximum benefit out of it. Uh, going back to adding Rome, grass, um, to a lucerne stand, what is the best time to plant this? Um, when you've got some moisture. So if you've got some moisture in the autumn, then you can put the brome in then. But if you haven't, um, then you, you'd want to be grazing it, grazing your lucerne stand and then trying to put your brome into it um, in the spring. But you, you've got to have some moisture to get to, that to happen. The best time is probably um, in the autumn if you have a, a wet autumn. And I know we didn't have one this last autumn, but if you had a wet autumn, then you graze the lucerne off, drill in the brome and let the brome come back as you're giving the lucerne a rest in that sort of March, April period that we were talking about because um, you're giving the, the brome a chance to um, establish as the lucerne's growth rate is actually slowing down. So it will give the brome a bit more opportunity to grow. In the spring, the lucerne's more aggressive because it's got that all, all that sugar and nitrogen coming up from below ground. So it's, it's, it's growth rates much faster. So it's less competitive with the brome in the autumn if you've got a wetter or, or um, a wet autumn. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just a bit of a call out too is that last questions, if we can uh, get your questions in, that'd be awesome. We've only got a few minutes left. Um, so what are the biggest misconceptions you find with managing lucerne crops? 
Um, well, probably the biggest one initially is that people think they'll have no winter feed. So, so that's, you know, often the impediment to not putting a lucerne stand in is they think I'll have no winter feed. And we actually have lots of options for dealing with winter. So we've talked about brome. So as you get a big area of lucerne, your lucerne itself becomes part of the grazing. We know how to grow winter forage crops, um, but that's probably the, 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 the biggest one. And after, if you say put in 20 hectares and then another 20 and then another 20, it's about year three when you might get a pinch. But part of that process of putting lucerne stands in is often going through a break crop, a brassica or a rye corn or a barley or something like that, which is then the winter feed. So that's the biggest misconception. The other one is that it's expensive. And um, it isn't really. What you're looking to do is establish a, a good quality um, seed bed with the fertility of ryegrass and white clover and, and 10 kilos of seed. Um, you know, it, there's not a lot of cost difference between establishing a good ryegrass white clover pasture as there is to establishing a lucerne stand. So that would be the biggest, the biggest misconceptions. And I, I don't want to um, swear by it, but the farmers that have done it tell me that they're getting about a 25 to 28% internal rate of return on investment. So, you know, that's a pretty good return um, on what they're getting with the lucerne stands going in. So, yeah, the upfront cost is probably something that puts people off. But I, I always say you've got to look at, you've got to discount costs of establishment across the life of the stand, whereas a rape crop I'm putting in every year. Same with the, you know, same with the turnip crop. It's every year. And the year I want the turnip crop or the rape crop in the summer is dry and it's died. And so I end up in this, vicious cycle of having to put in these single year crops that aren't producing much for me. Um, whereas if I can get my lucerne in, I'm looking for at least five years and hopefully seven to nine if I do it properly. Yep. Okay, thank you. So we've had another flurry of questions coming in. So I'll ask a few more um, and then we'll do what we did last week is we will just get Derek to answer some and I'll email the answers to the ones we don't do publicly. Uh, so we've got another stock one. So why do we see lambs dying on lucerne after a wet cold period in spring, um, especially if they've had fibre on hand and had their vaccinations? I don't know. In, in a cold wet spring they could be getting cold. Um, I'd be happy for anyone that's that's got that issue to, to come um, and, and help with that. So they've got fiber, they've got salt, they've got um, milk from mum, they should be doing fine. The cold wet, I mean, it, lambs don't like it being cold and wet and the lucerne, if it's tall, is then putting them into a wet environment. So they're possibly colder. Um, it's possibly colder and wetter and so I, I didn't show a photo, but I've got a photo that Doug um, shared me of, of having the, doing a little bit of mowing before animals go in. And mowing, he mows about 25% of it of the paddock um, two or three days before the animals go in, which can then provide the fibre, but also gives them somewhere to stand that isn't wet. If they're in tall herbage that's wet, they may actually be getting cold and it could be pneumonia or all sorts of things that are causing them a problem. Just on the animal health, one other I wanted to talk of that's probably relevant um, is coming out of a drought, I know we had some animals die of nitrate this year. So it was very dry and then we got rain. And um, in that first 24 hours, 48 hours after rain, the lucerne can spring into life. And if you put the animals onto it, actually there's very high nitrogen concentrations in um, the leaf. And so it can, it, th that period when it's dull, and it could be the same for the dull wet situation, there's not enough energy for the nitrogen to be turned into protein. And so you get very high nitrate levels in the leaves. And so I'm speculating that in dull overcast conditions, it might be that, that in the spring, the same as what's happened in the autumn. So you need sunshine to turn that nitrate, which is what the plants take nitrogen up. They always take nitrogen up as nitrate from the soil. It's in the soil water solution. 
Um, and that nitrate can be very high. And if there isn't enough sunshine, there's not enough energy to convert that nitrate into protein. And people would be familiar with that when they think of their kale crops or some of their winter crops, because we often go, don't feed them off in the, you know, in the early morning. We wait until the sun comes out so that we don't have nitrate poisoning on a lot of our winter forages. And I suspect we could have the same sort of thing in dull overcast conditions that are wet. That could be, and I'm speculating here, but that could be the cause of that lamb question we were talking about. But I know it was the cause this year of some people that lost um, lambs just after they'd had a drought period and then it rains. Now you've got a whole lot of warm soil, nitrogen gets taken up really quickly but there's not enough time for the you know, very high level of nitrate in the leaf. And the leaves are small because they've been under drought. So there's not enough time for them to convert that nitrate into protein. So you just want to hold off a couple of days after that rain before you put the animals back onto a, um, a previously drought stressed lucerne stand. So that's me speculating without having great evidence. That's cool, no, thank you very much for that. Um, we will end up on one more question and I'll keep it with the animal theme. Um, so what's the best way to avoid damaging the lucerne crown when grazing with cattle or do you just expect the stand not to last as long? Um, obviously if the stand is dry, you know, the, the drier the soil when the animals are on there, the less damage that you're going to get. It's when you've got wet um, conditions and the animals go in and they cut the the crown open and then you get disease into it. That's the, the biggest issue. So um, introducing cattle slightly later when the soil surface has dried out a little bit, when it's a bit firmer is probably the, the best way of doing that. Um, and mixed grazing um, probably helps there a wee bit as well. Put the cattle and the sheep together to, to do it together. But a cattle graze stand I'm not expecting to last as long as a sheep stand, sheep, a solely sheep grazed stand. For exactly that reason, you've got a heavier animal, so it's going to do a more physical damage to the plant, and that physical damage allows um, pathogens, fungi, pretty much in, fungi and bacteria to get into the crown and, and kill it off. Yep. There's a couple of questions that I'm going to take because I know you want to stop me. Um, Maturi clay, very dry in summer, quite wet in winter. If the water doesn't sit, we went through this last week. If the water doesn't sit in pond. Um, then I'd give it a go. And the same with the, the Taranaki one. Um, if you've got some dry periods, but you've got some rolling slopes that are west and north facing, you've got some of that sand country, I'd be giving it a go there as well. Where water sits in a paddock in the winter is not for a tap-rooted species. They don't like it. No oxygen. And I'll stop, Laura, because I can see we're over time. And you... <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thank you. are very quick with those last two. So thank you for that. Uh, we have had a um, response from a vet on the call from our shout out before. So the response is need to have a robust five to one program to be best practice. Two shots, four to six weeks apart with booster at least two weeks before they go onto the crop. So that is um, just a quick response that we have had. Um, so thank you very much everyone for jumping on board today, tonight and having a listen. Uh, Maria's been awesome on the chat there and has put up a few links. I see that she has just put an article up about dry, drought and nitrate poisoning um, and also the Lucerne e-tex um, that we have and how to sign up to that. So before we finish up, is there any last words you want to just round up the evening with Derek? Uh, no, look, it's been um, a really good opportunity to, to be in touch with people and, and I've really enjoyed watching the chat come through. There's opportunity out there and um, there are people out there that will answer your questions. So it may not be me, but there is a lot of people that are, are now quite experienced at growing and grazing lucerne and you're going to get it wrong. So it's, if you're starting off, things are not going to go perfectly when you start. But there are people out there that are quite happy and willing to um, help and are quite happy to give you advice. So it's important that you seek advice. I consider, you know, converting to a lucerne-based grazing system is about the same as converting a dryland sheep farm to a dairy system. You've got to learn a whole lot of new skills to be able to do it. 
and there's a community of people that are that are doing it that are ready and willing to help um, and the beef and lamb tech service is really good for that but if you know someone that's growing lucerne and doing it well ask them and for sub clover um, i think it's our next best option and particularly for um, hill country um, we haven't really done a good job on um, managing sub clover and we probably that's the next one to get better at Perfect. Cool. Thank you very much. And I see that Maria's also put the link up to the link, the Lincoln Dryland Research Centre as well, um, your web page, Derek, that you manage. So thank you very much, everyone, for jumping on board. This was recorded, uh, so we will be editing it and getting it out next week. Um, as we've mentioned before, last week's webinar has just gone on the internet today, um, so you'll be able to watch the establishment webinar if you wish. So thank you everyone very much. We appreciate you all jumping on board. If you do want to see more uh, webinars like this, please flick Maria and I a message. Um, we're always looking out for ideas um, or, or anybody that we can work with. So, and thank you very much for Derek, Natalie and Hugh for jumping on board and supporting us um, and to get these webinars going. So appreciate your help and yeah, thank you very much.